It's a privilege to be here and an honor to be asked to come all this way. Uh, at home, the conference at the uh, Devonshire uh, Community Center is like two minutes from my house, <laughs> so this is pretty far to come, but I, I am really pleased to be here, and, and it was a double blessing for me because my son lives in San Diego, and he came up to um, meet me and be with me this weekend, so um, I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, I was a Jehovah's Witness for 39 years, and, and I was a, actually a third generation Jehovah's Witness, and I was um, working on raising the, uh, the fourth generation when I was set free in February of 1986. So during those 39 years as a witness, I had never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ or the plan of salvation. You know, even if I had heard it, I don't think that I could have, um, could have grasped it or understood because Satan had built up all these walls in my, in my mind and I wasn't able to hear. Uh, my grandmother uh, was the first person that came in contact with Jehovah's Witnesses. She was about 14 years old and they uh, came to her door and uh, she listened to their message. And I, I think my grandmother was hungering to hear the word of God to, because she went to a liturgical the church and she really wasn't you know, into the Bible. And they came and presented their message and, and she accepted it. And through my grandmother, um, my grandfather became a Jehovah's Witness and they had two children, my mom and my uncle, and both of them were, became witnesses. My uncle brought his wife into the organization, and then uh, my uh, mom married a sailor, and he had a 10-year career in the Navy. And uh, my, my dad uh, gave up this career in the Navy. He was teaching music at Annapolis, but he gave that up to join the organization because you can't be in the military and be a Jehovah's Witness. So um, I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness from little on up, and we attended all of the meetings. We had um, a Tuesday night book study at, at different homes and where we study at a Watchtower publication, and then on Thursdays we had a ministry school and a service meeting. At the ministry school we learned how to speak at the doors or conduct a home Bible study. Um, the, the little, uh, the, the men would learn how to speak, or even the boys would just begin to learn how to speak from the platform. Uh, we had a minute of the service meeting where we learned policies of the society and what maybe was the, um, the offer that month, and we would work on that. Uh, on Sundays, we, had the, we went to two meetings, the public lecture and the, uh, the public talk, and the watchtower study. And then we went out in service. That was a big part of being a Jehovah's Witness. We went out from door to door. On Saturdays, we usually put in two hours, and Sundays sometimes also. We had these little slips we had to fill out, put our time on there um, for the month, and then our placements, whether we placed um, watchtowers, awakes, uh, um, books, Bibles, whatever, would go on that and we'd turn that in. And that's how the society or the congregation would keep a track of you as a publisher. Um, <clears throat> well, we uh, never missed any of the assemblies. We had circuit assemblies. There was a building built close to us in Harrisburg um, called the Grantville Assembly Hall. So we went there um, twice a year. We went to district assemblies and we went to, which I thought was a lot of fun, was going to um, international assemblies in New York. And uh, as a little girl, or a young lady, I guess I was like a teenager or whatever, I thought it was fun going to New York because I got to stay at a hotel and I got to ride the subway. And uh, we would go to Yankee Stadium. And some of these uh, were like eight days long, they were really long. And you'd have to sit from morning, afternoon, and evening for the assemblies. And, uh, but it was very impressive because we filled the stadium. And the, the uh, grass even had chairs and the polo grounds was an overflow. So there's a lot of people there, and it's very impressive because, you know, I was always told, I'm in the truth. This is God's organization, and all these people are coming out to these big assemblies, uh, all of us um, in the same um, belief system. So it was very impressive. Um, I uh, never celebrated any holidays. 
I did not celebrate any birthdays, and I never saluted the flag or sang the national anthem. And you know, being born into the watchtower, I just never had a choice of lifestyle. And frankly, I just didn't fit their mold for my life. And uh, I can honestly say that I never enjoyed going at, from door to door. Uh, I considered it to be drudgery. And as far back as I can remember, um, I always lived in guilt and in fear. I was I, in fear of being destroyed at Armageddon uh, because I wasn't doing enough watchtower works. And this is instilled into the children from uh, little on up because as soon as you have a baby, you take them out from door to door. You take your children to the meetings. They hear this. They know that what they're supposed to do. And, and they're, they're afraid they're going to be killed at Armageddon. And, you know, I was guilty my whole life because I, I just, um, I, I, my heart wasn't in, into it. And I always thought that the watchtower was the truth. I mean, I never doubted that. I thought, well, there's just something wrong with me. I used to look at everyone else, you know, doing these works of the Watchtower, and they seemed to have such enthusiasm, and I wished that I could be like that. Uh, I wanted to be a spiritual person like these other Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, finally, at, at, I was at age 13, uh, I thought, well, I better get baptized because I was getting older now, you know, and it was expected. And I, I just didn't feel, something just didn't feel right. Now, I didn't think it was the organization. I just thought it was me. Um, so I did get baptized, and you're baptized into the organization. And that would be like your membership, I suspect. Um, so it was um, a lonely life growing up. Um, I seemed to be different than the other witnesses. I just didn't fit, and so I, I really didn't have friends at the Kingdom Hall. And friends in the world were discouraged. So the one thing that I really did enjoy um, was taking dancing lessons. My mother started me in dance school when I was in the first grade. She started me taking ballet and tap, and uh, she, uh, she didn't think I'd make a career out of it. She just thought, oh, she's tall and skinny and lanky, and this will just give her some grace and poise. And, well, uh, none of the other, I didn't know any other children in the Kingdom Hall that went to dance school, so that kind of made me stand out as being different as well. <clears throat> when I graduated from high school, my parents gave me a choice. You can either pioneer, which means full-time knocking on doors, or you can go on to some further education, because they didn't want me to just dance. <laughs> But later on, I did open a dance studio, so I had, I've done that for 45 years. <laughs> but they never, that was not in the intention of my, my parents. But anyway, um, so when I, I graduated, I chose from high school, I chose to um, go to a medical arts school, which was a two-year program. Um, I certainly didn't want to you know, pioneer and put 100 hours in. But anyway, I did go to medical arts school. And it was a two-year program, and I ended up working at Harrisburg Hospital in the operating room for six years after that. But again, that didn't make me a very popular person with other witnesses because going further education is discouraged. Um, and I would be like a person who was bad associations, you know. So I don't know if it's the same today, but it was like that when I was, you know, young. Well, at t age uh, 22, I met a young man uh, who came from a very active witness family. And at last, I thought, this was an answer to my problem, a strong spiritual leader for a husband. And he was pioneering at the time that I met him. Um, he had cousins who worked at Bethel. Um, his father was something important in the organization. I really don't know what his role was, but I just know that he was a wealthy person. And I thought, this is, this is good. This is going to be good for me. So a, later, uh, a year later, we got married. Well, I soon came to find out that this family had a lot of problems. They had skeletons in their closet. Uh, they had psychological problems. Um, they had immorality plagued the family. 
And after, for me, after 12 and a half years of marriage and three children later, um, he left us. And my youngest, that was Adam, and he was only like eight months old. And I, I, that was just so devastating to me. I mean, co divorce wasn't even a word in my vocabulary. Um, so here I was, I was just alone. I mean, really alone for the, you know, at, for the first time. I, I didn't have God in my life. And so I thought the answer to my problem was to get really active in the witness work. I mean, I'm just gonna go gung-ho here. This is gonna, you know, this is what I need. So I sat my children down and, and we would study the lessons, we would study the watchtower, we would underline all the, the answers and you know, we'd be putting our hands up and answering questions and, and we, were out, we were leaders in going out in the service and we did all those things, but you know what, it just, I, I was just empty. Because there was just this void in my life and I finally, I just gave up and I, I decided that annihilation was going to be my fate. Um, I was just going to uh, go to sleep. Now, how bad could that be? Because we believed in, in annihilation, or in just soul sleep. And so I thought, well, going to sleep can't hurt. You know, that won't be so bad. We didn't believe in a literal hell. So uh, that's when I just, you know, just gave up. And then for the two years, I was alone, and then I met John. Um, John Eyre. <laughs> uh, this is an interesting story, how I met John, and it, it just shows you how, when you listen to the story, you see how God was maneuvering things around for me to really um, come to the real truth. Um, I, I was um, single then, and I, and I, I, I met this lady uh, who was in the same boat I was. Um, she had a baby, and I had a baby, uh, we were pushing strollers, and, and I knew her from years, from some years back. She was the owner of a Hansel and Gretel schools in Harrisburg. My children went there, and so we kind of hooked up. You know, this is a, somebody who I can relate to. We can have fun together. We took our children out to dinner and everything. And then she said to me, well, she wanted to join an organization called PWP, and that means Parents Without Partners. Now, that organization is not in existence today because of all the websites, of dating websites, or what have you. And uh, I, said, I, I said, Dorothy, I'm really not interested in using this as a, you know, a, a, to meet somebody. And, and she said, oh no, she said, they do things with your family, you know, children go to, you know, we can do picnics and, and play games and what have you. So finally I said, okay, I'll go. Well, we had joined this organization in a church and I'm going, like, oh dear, I hope there's nobody looking at me going into this church. And we joined the organization, came out, and uh, she, the, one of the first things she wanted to do was go to a dance at the officer's club at the Naval Depot. And I, I said, now you know I wasn't interested in this. And she just you know, kept pestering me, I guess, for about that week. And I finally, I guess by Thursday, I said, okay, I'll go with you. And so she came and picked me up on Friday and we went to this dance. Well, in the meantime, John was at home and he was um, just relaxing, I suspect, and, and uh, his cousin came over and he said, he said, Cousin John, he said, um, there's this dance at the officer's club. He said, get yourself ready, We're gonna, I'm gonna take you over there. And John kept saying he didn't wanna go. And so finally he succumbed and he said, okay. you know." So he went over and I was there, and he, there was, he was there sitting in the corner somewhere. I, I was just walking around the room, um, looking at the pictures and the walls, and my friend went into the ballroom, and I'm thinking, okay, what am I gonna do? That, you know, till, she's, till she comes out and takes me home. And I saw this gentleman sitting over there in the corner, and I thought, well, he doesn't look like he belongs to this group. He didn't look, he wasn't ogling at me or anything. And, and, uh, and, and he was older, and he had white hair, kind of bald, you know. I said, well, maybe I'll just go over and introduce myself. I know, and he looks safe. He kind of looked like my insurance man. And I thought, he just looks kind of safe. So I went over and I introduced myself and said, can I, you know, sit here? And, and so it was like cozy corner there. He was in a wingback chair, and they had a nice sofa. So we just conversed, for, and he's, one of the first things he said to me, he said, I'm a Christian, what are you? While inside, I was thinking, you know, where are the true Christians? 
And, um, and when, you know, the, I told him I was a Jehovah's Witness. But when he said the word Christian, I thought he was saying to me, um, I'm a moral person, you know, I'm a good moral person. I didn't know what Christian meant. And so we just talked that evening and uh, we shared all of our life story, his story. Um, he had, uh, his first wife died in a car accident, his second wife died of cancer. Um, and he was alone there. He was raising his last child at home. And uh, so we, I shared my story and what happened to me. And he said, by the end of the evening, my friend came out and she, you know, took me home. But he, he said, I'll look you up. So sure enough, by Monday, he came and looked me up. And we were right on Route 230, uh, was where I lived, and he had a warehouse in um, Lancaster County in New Holland. And it, you, it, you have to go Route 230 to get to New Holland, so it wasn't a problem for him to stop by. And he kept visiting me. And he, he didn't know too much about Jehovah's Witnesses at the time, but he said, well, hey, if this is the truth, he wanted to be in it too. So he started reading books from the Christian bookstore, and he told me something I'd never heard before. He said, the Watchtower is a cult. And I, well, that didn't sound very good, and I didn't like the sound of that. So <clears throat> he did bring me a bag of books that uh, the, I would call them apostate books. He brought them back to the house, and he said, here, read these. As soon as he left, I took him and deposited them in the trash can behind the house because, you know, I'm not supposed to read any of that. Well, you know, and a relationship was growing here, and um, we ended up getting married in six months, uh, six months later. So a lot of people at this point, they said, John, why would you marry somebody in a cult? And he says, uh, well, he said, he just thought it would be easy to get me out. He'd just show me how they lied to me, and I would just say, thank you. But I want to tell you, it does, it's not that easy. No way. Um, and when we got married, the, the battle really began. And he didn't feel like he had a lot of time to just love me out of the watchtower. And John went to the convention up at the Blue Mountains, to the Witnesses Now for Jesus convention, before, uh, before I, the year before I came out. And he... Um, they told, you know, he talked and met lots of people there. Bill and Joan Setnar, he met um, the Harnishes, that, which are my, um, Mim Harnish is my friend to this day. But um, they, they just, you know, they said they would pray for, you know, the situation for me. And, and they said, just be kind to her and just be loving, you know. But honestly, if he would have not pushed me, I don't think that I would just thought I was winning. You know, I was like, hmm, you know, he's coming my way. But uh, so we, the battle began. He had uh, all of this literature was all over my bedroom. He, and he would read my books in my library. I had a big, uh, or I still do, I have a lot of those Watchtower books back to Rutherford and Russell. And he would read those at night, stay up late till like 3, 3 a.m. in the morning. And, and the next day he'd say, now sit down, I want to read this to you. And he'd try to show me they lied to you here and they deceived you and they're a false prophet. And, I, I just wasn't hearing it, you know, I, but he just wouldn't not let it go. And uh, when we would get in the car to go somewhere, he'd pop in those tapes of Walter Martin, who had the counter cult ministry. Uh, or he got tapes up at the uh, convention uh, of witnesses who, who ex-witnesses who came out, and I'd have to listen to their testimony, you know. I was kind of captured in the car, you know. So this went on, and he would... He gave the children and I a challenge of, um, well, it was the, challenge, the first challenge he gave us was the date 607 BC. He said, what if that date's not really the fall of Jerusalem? And uh, okay, so I'm, I know that that was a very important date in, in uh, Watchtower theology uh, because they count, have a counting system that goes from 607 to 1914 is supposed to be when Jesus returned invisibly, um, not literally returning to the earth, but he, um, he returns invisibly and turning, turns his attention to the earth. And only those witnesses with have eyes of discernment could see it. That's right. So, uh, so I'm about to you know, find out how do I prove this date? And I went to the elders at the Kingdom Hall and I said, how do I prove this? And they said, well, you just go to historical evidence. 
And you know, so uh, I had I had already gone to my children's encyclopedia, which they had a Compton's in their room. So I looked up Jerusalem. It said it fell in 586 BC, and I was like, oh, okay. So John went to the library in the West Shore Library, and he came back with this big, heavy books archaeology books and I actually printed off the information I still have it. it's kind of yellow but <laughs> but guess what all these books said it fell in 586 so I was kind of shook up but you know I, I said well they made a mistake you know they're only human uh, I thought they made a mistake on this one but I'm sure that the doctrines are correct so the next thing John says to me he says well can, can you prove that the Alpha and the Omega who is the Alpha and Omega in Revelation? Um, can you prove that's Jehovah? So I'm looking, I'm reading it, and I'm going, uh, it says it's the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, uh, the one who is dead and alive again and had to held the keys of death in Hades. And I thought, wow, it sounds like Jesus. But I knew it couldn't be because it had to be Jehovah. So I went to the Kingdom Hall and I said, how do I prove that? you know, that the Alpha and Omega is, is Jehovah. And they said, well, go to society's publications. So I got home, and I got out that big blue book. It's the Aid to Bible Understanding book. It's a pretty thick book. I looked up Revelation, and it says, the angel speaking, uh, Jesus is speaking, and John is speaking, and they're all changing speakers in the same verse. I'm going, oh, I didn't get that. I'm like, Oh, okay, I didn't understand. So I said, I gave the book to John. And I said, here's your answer. You can read it for yourself. <laughs> so I think you can see that all this time, seeds were being planted. Um, maybe some things weren't quite right, but, you know, I just really believed that, yeah, I was in the truth, you know. It was just God's organization. And, uh, but finally, we're getting t pretty rough at home, you know. John was getting uh, impatient. He didn't have a lot of patience. So he's, he, <laughs> he had made several appointments with the Setnars that I could come and um, visit them and sit down with them and talk, you know. And, and I said, no, I wouldn't go. I mean, the Setnars were big time apostates. I mean, they, are, they worked up at Bethel and they turned away from the organization. And uh, I was like, I, knew, I just figured they were demonic people. So uh, at, we're getting pretty. You know, John's getting very anxious and no patience. So the third time he says, I've got to go, I thought, well, I guess I better go. It's a third appointment now. So I said, okay, well, I'll go, but I'm not going to drive in the same car with you. Now, this was in February. Uh, it was, you know, it was, I think there was snow out there. It was a not nice day. And we were going to Kutztown, which is about two and a half hours from home. And uh, so I decided I was going to follow him in my car. And I was writing this map how to get home, because I had to leave there fast, you know. I'd get in there and go home. So I wrote the map, and, and we didn't have GPS back then. So anyway, I'm crying, and I'm just calling, calling out to this only God, Jehovah. And so by the time that two and a half hour drive I got there, I was, I was a mess. Um, I, I was, you know, I had tears running down my face, but I got out of the car, and these people were so sweet, and I, something happened. I mean, all of those scales that were on my eyes, they just fell off. A and for the first time, I could actually hear what they were saying to me. Um, they shared with me some scripture. Um, they, they t you know, just shared some information, and they weren't like shoving anything down my throat, but really I could hear it for the first time. It was amazing. And uh, Bill said to me, Bill said, you know, he says, if, if you don't have Jesus, you can't have eternal life. And he gave me his book. It's called Questions for Jehovah's Witnesses. And he said, you go home and you read this book from cover to cover, and he said, uh, you know, just, you know, make sure you, you check everything out. And, and if I didn't believe that this was Watchtower um, copies in here, I probably had a lot of these in my library. I could just look them up in the original books and magazines. So I went through this book, um, but you know what really helped me? And this was, a, it took a week, it was a week of time. I looked up all the verses on this wheel in the back of the book. 
Um, it's everything that Jesus claims is at the top of the wheel. Everything that Jehovah claims is at the bottom of the wheel. And I could see from, lo from looking up all these verses, scripture, that they both make the same claim. They both claim to be the savior and the rock, the first and the last, the I am, the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, the creator, the light, the judge. Uh, I sat down with my children and I said, we're gonna look at these verses up and we were you know, looking them up and, and they said, mom, we believe you. And I'm going like, no, 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 it's not me you need to believe. You need to know for yourself who Jesus is. And after, I, this really proved to me that Jehovah and Jesus are one God. And you know, I, once I knew that, during that week of looking and studying this information, I, I knew uh, that Jesus was the savior and that he wanted to save me and that he shed his blood for me. And I made a decision uh, during that week, I knew that I wanted to accept him because uh, I didn't understand anything that Christians really believed. I didn't understand about heaven. I didn't really understand about hell or the end times or, you know, just, but I did know that Jesus is God and that he came to save sinners like me. And so I, I, I had accepted him. In fact, there's other ex-Jehovah's Witness came, couple came to my house on Saturday. That was Sunday when I went to the Setnars. That following Saturday, they came and um, uh, they prayed a prayer of salvation with me. And uh, that Sunday, that following Sunday, I was in church for the very first time. But, you know, I didn't have that time that a lot of witnesses who come out, they find out there's something wrong with the watchtower, they come out of it, but they get lost in the wilderness. That's what I call it, being lost. And they never really come to Christ, but for me, I came immediately to the Lord Jesus Christ. And my changes were not, you couldn't see that I looked different on the outside, but I definitely was changed in the inside. Because I, Jesus came and he set me free from all that bondage that I lived in all those years. Um, all that guilt and all that fear that I had was gone. And, and then I have the peace, and I have the peace that passes all understanding, and the assurance of the blessed hope. You know, after reflecting on my life's testimony, I think that you can see that I never thought that my watchtower works could earn my way into the paradise earth. And I think that that definitely worked in my favor because I already knew that I was lost. I knew that I was a sinner and I knew that I could not save myself. But don't be fooled, there are many other Jehovah's Witnesses that know in their heart that their works won't save them. Uh, I had a couple of Jehovah's Witness cleaning ladies that worked for me while I was still in the watchtower, and they, they expressed they were that same sentiment, they, they said that same thing that I was feeling. Um, Dear sweet ladies, very humble, said we just can't make it, we just don't think we're gonna make it. And I, I could, I could, I felt for them because I felt the same way, but I didn't tell them. Um, after coming out of the watchtower, I did take uh, all these books and things over to my parents, the watchtower books, and we sat. My husband and I sat down and we showed them, you know, how they had been lied to, and we tried to show them how they you know, were a false prophet. And we spent some time talking to my mom and dad, but they just. Um, after I left there, they just considered me dead. They wrote me off. Um, while I was there, let's see. Oh, I, I had said to my dad, who had a, a nearly lifelong smoking habit, I said, Dad, um, I said, you know, you, your habit is truly a dirty habit, but it won't prevent you from having eternal life because smoking in the watchtower is a disfellowshipping offense. And we had articles in the Watchtower that we um, studied that told us to turn in our family members or anyone we knew that was doing something that was a disfellowshipping offense. And so um, my mom and my grandmother, I mean, they knew that my, we all knew my dad smoked, and, um, but nobody ever, they didn't want to turn him in because they knew it would be a black mark on, on our family. 
And finally, my dad passed away in 2002. Um, he died of lung cancer. And my, my mom, we sort of reconciled a little bit there with the funeral and everything, and a little bit of short time after that. Um, and I, I, was, I was able to go to the funeral, and I listened to some of those Jehovah's Witnesses, and they were saying, we don't understand how Max could have had lung cancer because he didn't smoke. And, but, and, and another thing they, the, the um, elder said at his funeral service, he said um, the next thing that Max would be is standing at the great um, white throne judgment. And I thought to myself, well, they got something right, you know, but it's not a good thing. Uh, so I, I did present the gospel um, to my family, um, to my dad. I, I, I was able to talk to my grandmother, but my dad said to me, he, he said, well, that's just too easy to have faith and believe. So he, um, my mom, I, uh, she moved then to Maryland. My, I have a son, that, an older son that lives in, in Easton, Maryland. She moved there to be close to him. And I sent her a packet of a, a, a DVD, it's called Somewhere Forever, and I sent her also an Easter video of uh, me at our church service that, that year. Um, I was singing in the choir, and I thought, well, maybe if my mom sees me singing in the choir, she'll listen to this. And um, it had a good salvation message at the end. I was wishing she would listen to it, but I, as far as I know, she didn't. She sent it back to me. And she told me never to send her any of this again. So <clears throat> after, um, let's see, oh, I was going to tell you that my mom, my mom did pass away then um, five, I think it was five, it'll be six years in January. Uh, we went to visit, and my mom did have us over. My son, she had my son and his wife, and, and John and I over for dinner. And that evening, she um, had a lot of pain. and. Uh, my son took her to the, the emergency room, and, and we had stayed at a hotel. But the next morning, we found out she had a dissecting aorta and didn't, was just sent home to die. And we stayed. We, it wasn't our plan, but we were able to stay through Wednesday. That was the Sunday. We stayed through Wednesday and stayed at her house. I wanted to get a chance to uh, witness to my mother and present the gospel one more time. And we... Uh, stay there, but the witnesses were in and out, and I, I wasn't alone with my mom. The elder came, and then he left, and his wife came, and then other people came. It was just like a revolving door, uh, and so I didn't really have any time to spend with my mom, but on the very last day when we had to leave, I was alone for, with her for about an hour, and so I, I again tried to present the gospel to her one last time, but she said, you believe what you believe, and I believe what I believe, and I don't want to hear it anymore. So that was the last that I really talked to my mom, and she passed away that following Tuesday. Um, after I got saved, I had some new light on verses that were frequently used in the publications, such as Matthew 7, 13, and 14. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate, Broad is the way that leads to destruction, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. Um, well, you know, being in the Watchtower organization, I always believed that narrow way was the organization. If you weren't in the organization, you don't have a chance of life. But, you know, I came out of it, and I, and I knew that it was Jesus, because he's the way, the truth, and the life. Salvation is found in no other. So I knew that um, this narrow way was the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 10, um, or let's go, another verse that popped out at me here, John, 1 John 5, 12. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. Did you ever notice in Watchtower theology that Jesus is just a secondary person? He's like a great teacher. Um, you, you never hear about how he shed his blood for you. We never sang songs like that in the, in the songbook. Well, it, I knew, I just knew in my heart that I didn't have Jesus because um, even seeing a bumper sticker on a car that would talk about Jesus is the way or something, or a billboard, I was like, it kind of turned me off. So when I would see things like that, I, I knew that, you know, I didn't have Jesus in my heart. 
And then another scripture that we used a lot in the society with Matthew 10, 28, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. I was always taught to believe that this body is all there is, you know, I'm going to go back to the dust to the ground like a dog and be buried. And I, I was just a mere mortal. And um, that scripture was commonly used in the organization. But you know, if you look at it and read it, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. We're seeing two things here. And why couldn't I see it before? You know why? Because I was reading everything with my watchtower glasses on. I couldn't see the truth of the scripture because that's why they keep you reading their books and, and keep you going to all the meetings so that you're going to have watchtower doctrine in your head. So when you do read the truth in, in a verse, you're not going to see it. And I didn't. But you know, Paul said he would be rather be absent from the body and present with the Lord in 2 Corinthians 5, 6-8. So there's no extinction there. That night I took that bag of books to my parents. Uh, before I left there, I said, do you have that purple Bible, that purple interlinear? And, and I said, can I have that? So they gave it to me. This is this purple Bible, the kingdom interlinear translation. That the occult ministries always call it the purple Bible. Well, it's printed by the Watchtower Bible and Tracts Society. And I uh, took this book home and you know, got a lot of different references here. I'm going to share one with you. Um, here on the right side of the page is the Westcott and Hort Greek text, and underneath is all the English word-for-word -word interpretation. And here is the Watchtower's New World Translation on the left side. And here's what it says in John 1.1. 1, 1. And this is reading from the New World Translation. In the beginning, the word was, and the word was with God, and the word was a God. But if you look over here, and in the, under the Greek, it says, in beginning was the word, and the word was toward the God, and God was the word. Wow, what a revelation. Um, you know, witnesses are not reading this book. They, we didn't. I think they don't publish this anymore. But just to make sure it was cor everything w was correct about this, we invited a Greek Orthodox priest to come to our house. <laughs> so he came in, we showed him the book, and he sat down and he, he read it, and he said, well, he said, this Greek and, and the um, interpretation, the word for word English is correct. He said, but this over here, said, this is distorted. This, uh, this Bible version over here is, is perverted. So um, we didn't leave any stones unturned. We were just checking out everything. <laughs> so um, I, that was quite a, re a revelation to find the truth in their own publication. Another verse that we used to hear referred to a lot in the publications was James um, 2.17, faith without works is dead. You see, in uh, Watchtower theology, works comes first, followed by only a hope of salvation. And um, that's how I got, had a hard time coming out out of uh, getting over that, I think, because I thought, well, that means I have to work. And it, we never referred to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 that says, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, the true gospel of Jesus Christ puts faith in Jesus for our salvation first, followed by works from our heart generated for love for the Lord, generated by love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And even if we fail, you know, God is faithful to keep us in his hand. He's not going to let us go. Um, once I, I believed in him, I was adopted into the family of God. And nobody can change, nobody can take that away. Uh, I may have lost my mom and my, my dad, my family, through all of this, but hallelujah. You know, I, I am in the family of God, and, and I have lots of brothers and sisters in Christ. And I just wanted to show, share with you, this is my wedding picture to um, my Jehovah's Witness husband. It, we were married in a kingdom hall in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. 
And every year there was a banner um, over the, the, the banner for the year, like the text verse for the year, and it was put over the platform. And it, that year the banner read, lift your heads up because your deliverance is getting near. Little did I know my deliverance was getting near. So in conclusion, I, I'd just like to share this chorus which is so meaningful to me. Uh, I stand redeemed by the blood of Jesus. The price is paid, my debt is gone. The chains that bound me no longer hold me. Because of Calvary, I stand redeemed. Thank you very much. <laughs>